So thank you all very much for joining us for the last session of the day on the socioeconomic issues that cancer survivors face. So in planning the meeting, we started with kind of where we are and how far we've come from the, uh, from the Lost in Transition report, and then talked about the physical and then socio or psychosocial issues that cancer survivors face. And now we're going to talk about the economic issues, and we're going to look at employment, health insurance, and um, financial toxicities that are all um, interrelated, but all um, incredibly important factors that face cancer survivors in their post-treatment survivorship life. Um, you know, it's hard to talk about this without acknowledging the, the Affordable Care Act that's helped so many patients, uh, cancer survivors, have access to insurance and to give them the peace of mind of not having to worry about their uh, insurance being tied to their employment and having the peace of mind to be able to change jobs or start a business or end or start a relationship that doesn't have to do, uh, that where they don't have to worry about insurance as a factor in making those decisions. And, um, the, and the Senate is voting tomorrow on this. This is something that we at the, at the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship have been working on all year with many of our colleagues in the cancer community, and you'll hear today from, we're starting with three uh, patient stories talking about the issues that they've faced in both financial and insurance and financial toxicities and access to health insurance. Um, it's been really remarkable to me hearing from so many cancer survivors across the country this year about how much um, the Affordable Care Act and the expansion of Medicaid has helped them in their own cancer journeys. And that's just the few that we've talked to, and there are millions who have, who have been helped. So we're going to get some of the data on that today and talk about um, the financial toxicity. So in the last few years, the, co the concept of financial toxicity has really taken hold, and we're now really considering the financial side effects of treatment, just like we consider the physical side effects of treatment, because they have such a huge impact on the individual's life and even on their potential outcomes. So uh, I look forward to a great uh, panel, and we, we have three patients who will present, and then three um, experts talking about different access, access, aspects of the data, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. So we're going to start with e-patient Dave DeBronckhart, who um, has been asking wonderful questions and now is going to share his story. Thank you. Well, you know, it's funny. First of all, thank you. Thank you for everyone who's involved in my getting here. I'm somebody who, somebody in the back just looked at me and said, break a leg. Well, 10 years ago, I did. It was a, it was a, I fainted in the bathroom and I landed on the giant, bone met in my left femur, and when I woke up, uh, my femur was shaped like this. So here's a patient safety tip. If you're going to have a pathological fracture, pass out cold first, because I had no pain. By the time I woke up, I was in shock. And then the medics came and gave me morphine by the time the shock wore off. Uh, there is a great risk. I know this very well, so th thank you for involving me. I, and th the other patient voices, my heart was warmed. I now make a living traveling around the world doing speeches about the role of the patient in healthcare. I have never in my 560 events in 16 countries seen so many potent patient voices, starting from Neeraj uh, and uh, Hedy, you, you know I've been tweeting at you for the power of your, of your speeches. A real problem that we face is that the risk of selection bias, because when we listen to this quality of group, we are at the top of Olympus and we are out of touch with reality. I myself speak with the handicap that I'm a white male, college educated white male, and I can't know the, the world of others. Now, if you've ever heard me speak before, you know I tend to use my slides as like a TV visual. They don't hang around, so we'll see how well this clicks. All right, one example of our problem here, people talk about all payer claims databases. They won't show us a thing about people who've fallen out of the system or who have given up. All right, so if we want to come up with wise policy recommendations, we need to make a point of getting out of Washington, getting to what somebody in my industry, the printing industry, called ground truth. Uh, I tweeted from the last session here, I, Real time, this is jazz, baby, all right? I, 
until we have data on outcomes, we won't get funding for survivorship. I understand that, but here's the big intellectual question. Who gets to say which outcomes? Right? It's one thing if you want to talk to somebody who's looking at the biopsy under the microscope. If it's, some, it's one thing if you want to look at just years of survival or progression-free survival. What about the caregivers who are suffering? My wife this January just had nothing but foot surgery. I mean, it was significant foot surgery. I got worn out taking care of her. My weight gained back 10 of the 40 pounds that I had managed to lose when I decided not to be pre-diabetic anymore. You, you can't look at any database. You've got to do what you did here. Have real people who are suffering on the front line, and I'll get back to that later. Right? Ask patients and caregivers, what outcomes should we be measuring? Go to ground truth. Right? This is the question that people ask a lot. You know, good people doing care today ask this. We need to do it regarding money as well. What's important to you? Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, this is a phenomenal article. Just search taxonomy of burden. I've got some close-ups of it. It's a paper published in uh, one of the BMC journals a couple of years ago by Victor Montori at Mayo and a couple of, uh, of co-authors. They have this phenomenal diagram. Rather than doing a taxonomy as a linear outline, they, did, they have this like spider web diagram, and I'll, I'll zoom in on this. You can look at all the different categories of things. You see, the importance of this all at once circular diagram is that this is the patient reality. You don't just work your way through an outline. This is all at once. In, in my case, I live an hour drive away from the cancer center, Beth Israel Deaconess, that saved my life. Do I love good medicine? For heaven's sake, my median survival at diagnosis was 24 weeks, and that was 10 years ago. You know, along the way, I broke my leg. Along the way, a lot of other things happened. I had the great benefit of being in a clinical trial for a new protocol of my drug. So my care didn't cost me anything except for the two times the legs broke, and then I had a $500 copay. Taxonomy of burden. Take this, use it, use it to stimulate discussions in your planning sessions. Every patient will have a different map of what things are important there, okay? There is no formula. For myself, I decided that I would ask a couple of experts. You know, it's, it's funny. I sir, have been through survivorship on one cancer, but Kim Martin, uh, who lives out near Columbia, Maryland, uh, four. She's up to four cancers now. Right, uh, and it's funny because you know the uh, if you've ever if you've been lucky enough to go to Paris a few times, the third time I haven't, I've only been there once. But the third time you go, you notice things you didn't notice the first time, so you get a better, more informed perspective, which is really important because one of the great myths that holds back patient-centered care improvement is the idea that patients are naive; they're not they're not astute. So good. How do you address that? Talk to the repeat experts. Okay. There's also the phenomenal Alicia Staley, who I know some of you are good friends with, uh, and she too has, uh, has been through the same. Uh, Jesse Grumman, who was mentioned earlier, was another lymphoma patient as a young woman and had three other cancers before she finally died a few years ago. Good sources of information. Now, I want to refer to this wonderful book report published by the IOM in 2012. This is the problem that we talked about a lot this morning, where improvements don't reach the point of care. Uh, but I actually went in and I modified this because this visualization doesn't really get the job done well. Take a look at this. What really happens, this says people do good science, right? Insights poorly managed, that results in a smaller body moving forward. Some of that work turns into evidence. And then, but if the evidence is poorly used, that turns into less care, even less, and the experience is poorly captured. What actually reaches the patient is a fraction of what we could be achieving, okay? And I, one of my conclusions here will be, see, this is not okay. One of the big problems when I worked in industry, if we delivered, a, if we produced a, a brilliant product and our sales team couldn't bring it to customers successfully, the sales team got thrown out. 
because it is not sufficient to develop a solution and have it fall short. The 17-year dissemination delay, why is it? I heard about this, and when I started evangelizing, uh, people were saying, yeah, it takes 17 years to adopt new knowledge. I kept saying, what are the details on that? Where's the original? It took five years before I could find anybody who could actually hunt down the original ballast paper. And then I found that it was 17 years for half of doctors to start adopting new knowledge. Well, to me, this is like this. You get a great new fire truck, right? And the thing falls in a sinkhole. Well, you know, if you, I know people whose children have died because a solution existed and it hadn't reached the front lines. And then you find highly engaged, e-patient, for those of you who don't know, means empowered, engaged, equipped, enabled. People who are being engaged saying, can I find anything more? And doctors say, stay off the internet. I don't have time for that. We can do better. We can do better. And who, if it's not the National Academies of Science, I can't yell very well at the medical professions because I don't have their training. Who is better positioned in the world to say, hey, you guys, you got to stop that. Make a point of bringing the best information. Now, this actually ties in. Have you heard, did you see this report in The Lancet a few weeks ago on amenable mortality? The US healthcare system, everyone knows they're the most expensive, most financially toxic in the world, ranks 38th on amenable mortality. That amenable mortality is deaths that would have been amenable to a cure if the system had done its job. Okay? We can do better. I want you to be thinking, what can we do to do this better? And anyway, so the number one thing, it's, it's, it's funny, Darcy earlier said, I've got some things I want you to remember from today and then I'll do my assignment. I'm actually weaving them together. Uh, Tell people this is a problem and we must end it. We must do better at getting care to the point of need. Well, and that's then from the same report here, we have this wonderful line. Engaged, empowered patients are essential. A learning system must be anchored on patient needs and perspectives. This is the answer to the value question. Who should say, is the system working? Are we doing the most valuable things? It's the patient's perspectives, and you can't tell me that I'm just a lay punk with a bad opinion, because this came from you, so there. <laughs> right? So, promotes the inclusion of patients, families, and other caregivers as vital members of the team. Just go follow your own advice, for heaven's sake, okay? Patients and caregivers are the ultimate stakeholder. I'm a professional speaker. I get speaking invitations to conferences with all stakeholders. There's insurance companies, governments, vendors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, no patients speaking. Well, um, so I'm sure you've all heard of this. I don't have to, you know, the surprise insurance bills and so on, the financial toxicity here. How can I be responsible for my own life if I can't find out what it's gonna cost me. Kim Martin saved the system 150 to $200,000 by opting out of chemo. She went with complementary and alternative medicine, which was not reimbursed. She ended up paying for all of it. How about we align incentives so that what the patient values, right, gets, uh, is aligned with what the system values. This uh, item, I didn't know this was from three years ago. Right? The guy gets surgery, he made a point of making sure that the hospital was in network, the surgeon was in network, then he got a bill for 117 grand for an anesthesiologist he didn't even know was going to be in the room. All right? And he had no recourse. We should make that illegal. You are not allowed, any more you can, if you can't do it for auto repairs, for heaven's sake, why should you be able to do it in a situation like this? Well, but one of my aphorisms, Activists get to work on these things, we don't complain, as we perform better when we're informed better, and it's perverse to keep us in the dark and then say we're naive, all right? So a friend of mine, Jeannie Pinder, formerly of the New York Times, has an initiative where she is crowdsourcing prices. They're running it, they've been running it for several months in New Orleans now. This is the book, if you don't know how bad this is. It is a disservice to the good people that so much financial toxicity and malarkey. So I'll just I'll run through my own personal. My kidney cancer was paid for, but then I ended up with multiple skin cancers. 
Uh, and the effort, this is not the same scale of stuff, but just consider what I had to go through to be responsible for myself. The first thing is that the, when my last day job ended, I ended up, uh, my COBRA expired, so I had to go on uh, individual insurance. And when I was, so I was talking to Blue Cross in New Hampshire about this, and they said, have you ever had XYZ? They said, cancer. I said, yes. They said, oh, okay, we don't have any plans for you. That, well, that was back in the days of pre-existing conditions. But they said, we have five high-risk plans. And I said, all right, what are they? And I got these five PDFs that with different premiums, different deductibles, different copay after deductible, maximum out of pocket, and stop loss maximum. Which one's my best deal? Now, it's perverse if we turn to patients, never mind somebody who's in stress because their husband's got glioblastoma blastoma or something, and say, all right, um, size this up, we need an answer. Well, basal cell carcinoma is not in a rush, and I am an obstinate, you can't pull that on me, guys. So I spent three months researching, I did, and so I took all that and I made an Excel spreadsheet. What if my actual spending is 1,000 this year, 2,000, 3,000? You know what? The people in the insurance company called actuaries, they have all that information. They're, they're Zooming me and I Zoomed back, all right? And I, I knew, well, and so, so this is like formulas, right? If max OOP is less than J17 plus blah, blah, blah. That's, that's what it took to be an empowered consumer in this situation. So finally, I had to graph it, and I ended up choosing $10,000 deductible insurance. 10000 because that was my choice, because I had the information. Well, so wouldn't you know, three months later, I'm giving a speech at a Robert Wood Johnson conference, and I come down off the stage, and a doctor from Maine uh, says that thing on your jaw, you should have it looked at. My face was on a jumbotron, you know, which, and it turns out it was a basal cell. All right, so I go in and they say, basal cell on your face, best thing is Mohs surgery. I said, great, what's that gonna cost? And you know what they said? We don't know, ask your insurance company. And I asked my insurance company, and you know what they said? We don't know, ask your hospital. And I said something roughly akin to the heck with this. And I spent those three months, so let's see. This, so here's, um, I'm gonna skip over this stuff. Uh, and that guy in Health Leaders said, patients are the only ones who don't have any skin in the game. So I published an RFP, request for proposals for my skin cancer. <laughs> like, don't tell me, right? Well, and this is, so, and I, you know, if you read the fine print, and this is still, if you Google ePatient Dave Skin Cancer RFP, you'll find it. I started at the front the same way I learned to do in business by saying this is not going to be about the cheapest vendor. All right? I believe in partnership. It's important to me. I believe in my cancer, my questions being answered, and so on. Well, finally, I ended up having, I still couldn't get a straight answer, and I ended up, I blogged all of this. Spend, I spent three months talking to Lay Clinic, Beth Israel Deaconess, and Dartmouth Hitchcock. Discovered they all use different CPT codes, uh, and but it all averaged out to somewhere between sixty-five hundred and seven thousand dollars. Of course, nobody responded to my RFP. But on the blog discussion, another dermatologist piped up and said, "Well, you know, before there was Mohs, we would just cut it off. Did you ask about excision?" said, well, that's interesting. The system kind of failed me here. Seriously, think about disadvantaged people, right? And don't give me any crap about, well, don't worry about it. Insurance will cover it. Because then people turn around and say patients are responsible for having an expensive healthcare system. Get me the information, and then we'll talk. Well, so I went back around and found that would be 1000 to $1,200. I ended up choosing the provider who was closest to me and once I got in the chair, he said, this e-patient stuff is kind of interesting. You know, um, this is not a high risk location. If you want, we can just burn it off with a needle. $685 is what I actually paid. Now this is, that's, this is the dream of high deductible plans, but some people say don't say high deductible because patients will never go see the doctor, and I know that's a real problem, but I am living proof in more ways than one that we can do better if we're committed to doing better, finding a way to put out this blasted house fire, right, without the fire truck ending up in a sinkhole. And of course, people always say, well, Dave, you're abnormal, right? My patients aren't like you. Well, 
I get a lot of material off of Facebook, and on election day in 2012, it just so happened that this popped up. Oh no, well, this, uh, this guy. This guy gave a TED Med talk, why aren't patients like consumers? And I wanted, I was there, unfortunately, and I, I actually, I met him and I restrained myself from wanting to strangle him. In the process, in the note, in the process of searching for a, a better price for a CT scan, I had taken my bill from Beth Israel Deaconess from the last one, and I had gone shopping for, okay, I'm gonna need some blood work. Well, this guy's from Quest Labs, and uh, his lab, when I called around, was one of the ones who said, we can't tell you what the bill will be. And he's saying, why don't patients act like consumers? You know, people spend more time shopping for TVs. Well, here is this flyer from election day in 1912, vote no on women's suffrage. And you know what the number one bullet point was? 90% of women aren't asking for it, <laughs> right? Don't restrict what power you offer people because most people aren't asking for it yet. That is a modeling error to look at limited data like that. Instead, give us information, give us incentive. Kim Martin, in preparing for this, said, you know, can't we do something to align incentives, right? So it will, can't we go beyond financial toxicity, people going into medical bankruptcy, by saying, let us be your partners in helping solve the problem. That's what patient empowerment is about. So, oh, no, I love this also. Once people get into cognitive dissonance, 80% of women eligible to vote are married, so all they could do is double or cancel their husband's votes. It's like, <laughs> once you decide that somebody's not capable of something, your mind will go all kinds of crazy places. <laughs> and we can do better. That's my appeal. Please, let us help, right? And in particular, we have to go out of our way, go to the front lines where care is happening, ask those people, how's it working out for you? Is, it getting, is there anything that we should be doing instead of what we are doing so that it's more valuable to you? Thanks for your attention.